Thank you very much. <clears throat> Without further ado, skip past the legal mumbo jumbo. So just a little bit of background about this project that I've been working on for, I guess, since the past, uh, since August, I would say. Um, I'm sure as a lot of folks here, we follow people on Twitter and we, we find out about certain sorts of things. And uh, this is a particular uh, journalist and security researcher who uh, basically at some point in time, he called out a scenario where some application was distributing a private key. Um, so there's a Cisco app and they had a private key. And then he says, someone ser should search for these things in a systematic way and uh, somebody who can crawl the web. And I started to think that basically planted the seed of uh, a little project I started. Um, a few years ago, uh, I did a, a presentation at um, some trade show that uh, involved talking about Android apps. And I was basically looking at Android applications that were not validating SSL certificates. Uh, so I basically had this pile of just over a million Android apps and I figured, well, I can now take a look at this and get an idea of, are there any Android apps that include private keys? So. Um, just uh, did a quick, quick little search and uh, decided this this would be something interesting. Uh, so why do people really care about private keys? Uh, you know, so this person on Twitter said that that this was a particular thing of interest. Uh, a private key can be used for a number of different things, and um, it kind of depends on what the key is used for, uh, the, the whole impact of it. Uh, one of the things that you do when you distribute a, an Android application is you actually sign that Android app. Uh, so a, a particular private key could be a signing key for Android apps. You could also do the same thing with iOS apps. Uh, I've also seen uh, private keys that are used for encrypting HTTPS traffic. Um, so when you're on your favorite banking website, uh, the reason, the way that they're able to uh, protect the traffic to that site is because they have a key. Uh, so there's really a wide range of uh, uses for private keys. Uh, and so I decided to dig into Android apps that include them. Uh, so the thing about the million apps that I had, those are from about 20, 2014. So I, I, you know, I came up with uh, a number of private keys and I decided that this would be something worth a little bit more research. Uh, so this is really the general uh, aspect of how I'm downloading Android apps. Um, now, obviously, APK Spider is a script that does some of the, the, the nitty gritty, but uh, if you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm picking out random words uh, from dictionary files. Uh, I picked a, a number of different languages to not limit my uh, search to just uh, English language things. So I'm really just picking a word by random and I'm searching for it. Uh, the library that's being used, there's a library called GPlay CLI, which is a command line interface for the Google Play Store. Uh, what you can do is you can search for that term uh, that you've picked from the dictionary. And what it'll do is it'll tell you what are the apps that match that search term. And it'll tell you the app name and it'll also include uh, version numbers. You got a quick question? Correct, yes. This is only free. Um, so any of the paid apps will also have similar issues. This was the same thing I ran into in the past with SSL research. The problem is um, I've currently downloaded about 1.8 million apps. And so even if those are 99 cent apps, uh, I'm not paying for that. Uh, so basically what it's doing is it's downloading these. I've just kind of have a throwaway Google account that I've been downloading apps since August from and they still haven't turned it off. So um, good for me. And then what I'm doing is I'm using a library called AndroGuard. Um, there used to be a script in it called Andro APK Info. I think they've removed it, but I ended up re-implementing it. But basically what it's doing is it's telling you what files are included in an Android app. And it'll also include information about MIME types and also what the signing certificate is for that app. Uh, so I'm looking for key files. Uh, just to do a little bit of housekeeping, I'm deleting old apps and then repeat. So this is basically it. It's a re relatively straightforward process of searching for a term, looking at the metadata of that APK and going from there. 
And these are the two links. They're both on GitHub, both Gplay CLI, which allows you to search and download apps, and AndroGuard, which gives you a little bit of ability to look into an APK to see what's inside of it. Um, one of the things that, I, that happened when in my first uh, research back, I, I hate to use the term research, my first little uh, experiment back in 2014 is I just started downloading things and I put them in a file or put them in a directory, uh, which is kind of neat to start out with. And it's like, okay, I can actually download an app. Uh, but eventually you get a million apps and then for every one of those apps you have associated meta file. Uh, so basically I had a directory with, with too many files in it. Uh, the strategy this time around is for every APK that's downloaded, you do a SHA-256 hash of it, and then you put it in a directory structure based on that hash. So what that kind of ensures is you'll never have a directory that has like more than 256 subdirectories in it. Uh, and the other, the other thing that I did is early on, if I have to like crawl a directory tree in order to look for a particular app, it, it, it takes way too long, even if you have a fast file server. Uh, so I'm just using SQLite. Uh, I've got a SQLite database that has my APKs. I have a separate one for the files that are contained within the APKs, and then a separate one for the keys. Um, the reason I did separate files was basically so I could do concurrent operations. SQLite is kind of like a single user sort of thing. Uh, so now that I've got this pile of Android apps, uh, I've got over two billion files. What do I look at? How do I know which ones are private keys? Um, the fact that I'm actually using SQLite gives me the ability to leverage that capability. And if you look here, I'm really just looking at file extensions. Um, and then the very last search term there is uh, the MIME type of the file. So that would pick up like Java Key Store or anything that has the word key in it. Uh, so that's cast a little bit of a wide net. Uh, the other files, it's really just based on the file extension. So it's, it's kind of, uh, if, if somebody used a file type that doesn't have a MIME type that uh, AndroGuard is aware of, I might not see it. But in the end, I'm still able to see a lot of key files. This part I'm going to zip through a little bit. I just wanted to get this information into the slide deck. I'm not going to talk to every slide. But as you start downloading key files, you'll see different key types. PKCS1 is not encrypted. It's RSA only then you can actually have an encrypted version of that, which has a password associated with it. PKCS gives you ability to do things other than RSA. The other thing about the keys that you download is that those prior examples were PEM encoded, which is basically base64. You can also have key files that are DIR uh, encoded. And the way that I can tell if a file is DIR encoded is I can actually leverage OpenSSL, which comes with an ASN1 parser. And I can basically say, parse this particular file as if it were ASN1. Um, and then if I see like a non-error exit status and I see a particular um, match in the results, I know that I've got a DIR encoded file. So basically, you end up with a lot of different formatted key files. Um, and you kind of have to treat them all differently. Uh, the one that I'll focus on just a little bit here is PKCS12. Um, and this kind of explains some of the things that I've been doing later on in the project in that uh, PKCS12 is a container for whatever you want to put inside of it, key related, which could be a public key, a private key, a certificate. Uh, the password protection is, op is optional, but generally speaking, every PKCS12 has a password. Um, in some cases, it's a null password, but it's still a password. Uh, the password causes container level encryption. So what that means is I don't know what's in a P12 file until I decrypt it. So if I don't have the password for that key store, I don't know if it's just a certificate or it might be something a little bit more sensitive. So uh, this leads me to cracking a number of files. Uh, related to PKCS12 is I've got Java key stores. Very similar to the PKCS12, except for a Java key store. I only realized this recently. Um, there's no container level encryption for a Java key store. So that means I might have a Java key store that has some sensitive goods in it. Um, but the container is not encrypted. So what that means is I know the contents of that, and I will know out of any Java key store if I want to bother to crack it or not. By default, the private keys are indeed encrypted. Um, I, I uh, picture it kind of like a zip encryption where you can tell what's inside of a zip file without knowing the password, but in order to actually extract the sensitive stuff, you need it. Uh, and then Bouncy Castle is a very similar sort of container format. Uh, no, encryption, no container level encryption is used. Private keys share the same password. 
Um, there was, uh, I thought I had an epiphany with this bouncy castle format in that I ended up with like accidentally finding password hash collisions with it. And it turns out it only uses 16 bits for the uh, container level uh, password. But because a bouncy castle, just like Java key store, is not encrypted at the container level, it really doesn't matter. So it was a little bit of a little, little bit of a, a, a dead end. Quick, yeah, yeah. You can tell what's inside of it. So I'll know if it's a certificate or a private key. And if it is a certificate, I know the details of it. Um, uh, I, I'm going to be a little bit tight for time here. So I'm going to try to maybe hold off questions. If you have a question, uh, take note of it. And if we have time at the end, we'll get back to it. Um, sorry, but 30 minutes is not enough to really talk about this stuff. Um, so one of the things that I realized as I'm looking at these apps is certain app developers try to hide the fact that they're including a private key in their app. So they know what they're doing, um, but because I'm able to leverage the MIME type, I'm able to not really care about the file name. Uh, so here's in something slash key store slash comet. All right, it's in a directory called key store. Uh, here's key2.txt. It's actually a Java key store, which is a binary format, but they call it a text. Uh, this one has spaces in the file names. This one's a little bit better, you know, 10305.bin. Um, if I was not looking at MIME types, I would not know that that's actually a key store. Um, this one is odd in that they call it an APK. Uh, here's uh, this developer is exceptionally tricky here. So they're putting something in slash fonts slash data.ttf, and it is indeed a key store file. Uh, finally, at the end here, we've got somebody that put it in a ping file. Um, I, I assume that they realize that they're doing something that they shouldn't, but they're just trying to kind of hide a little bit by, by using clever file names. But when you look at MIME types, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I kind of touched on this earlier. Why are we cracking passwords? Well, if I have a PKCS12 file, for example, I don't know if there's a private key in it until I crack it. Uh, and so, the impact of the fact, you know, let's say I come across a P12 file and it has a private key in it. Um, if it has a trivially crackable password in it, that's a higher impact. When it comes to cracking passwords, this might be all like repeat for you, but uh, we're able to, whenever possible, leverage GPU hardware. Uh, if you just look at the architecture of a CPU in general, you can see you've got a, a handful of arithmetic logic units here. And it's an all-purpose sort of piece of hardware where I can tell it to do whatever it wants. Uh, but if we were to compare that to the architecture of a GPU, I can see I've got a lot more units at my disposal. So anytime I'm doing something massively parallel, uh, GPUs are great. Uh, when it comes to the cracking software, I'm basically using John the Ripper and Hashcat. Those seem to be the, the, the most popular uh, password cracking tools. Both of those support different subsets of keys, but they generally both have GPU capabilities. Depending on the file format, you might not be able to leverage a GPU. So as I start cracking some of the passwords, uh, I, I started to look into what makes a strong password or not. Um, and it becomes very quick, quickly, or it quickly becomes clear that the strength of a password has to do with the number of characters that you're using. Uh, so for example, if I have a password that only uses lowercase ASCII characters, that's not as good as something that uses mixed case. Or if I have something that has um, symbols in it as well. So basically it's a factor of the two aspects of the size of the password or excuse me, the character set size, which is the number of different uh, symbols that you use and also the length. Uh, so just to help you realize that, uh, very simply, if I have just the digits 0 through 9, and if I have a password of length 1, how many passwords do I have total? Anyone? 10, right? 10 to the 1. If I have a password of length 2, 0 through 99, I end up with 100, so on and so forth. What you end up seeing is that the length exponentially influences the strength of the password. If I just look at the exponent here, it is indeed mapping one and one, one to one to the length of the password. 
So basically what I ended up doing is I did an experiment of randomly generated passwords um, and then also cracking them just with a CPU. Uh, it's a 64 core system and it's an MD5 and you can kind of get an idea of the various sort of password strengths. So at the very top here, I've got a four character, or I've got a four length password of character set size, or sorry, care set size of 26, being that it's just single case ASCII, and it took one second. Uh, so that worthless. Um, you can see as you go on, I, um, kind of towards the end here, if I have an eight length uh, password of character set size 36, it took about three hours. So we're, we're getting better. Um, this is about as far as I went. I, at some point, I stopped it. And this, this is, uh, yeah, this is running John the Ripper in incremental mode. I could see at the very end here, my best password on the screen is one that is eight uh, characters long. And it has a character set size of 52. Uh, that is because I'm using both uppercase and lowercase, which is generally not a good password. Uh, but just using CPU, it took about 22 days. Uh, so. This part is, is perhaps interactive, depending on, on uh, how interactive the audience is feeling here. Uh, but we've got a game. And this is, given a particular password I'm going to show you, I would like to know if you think it's a strong password or a weak password. Weak. Very good. Why is that? Well, it's actually in the rock you password list. Anything that's in a password list is worthless. Uh, you don't have to brute force, you know, when you're talking about cracking passwords, um, if it's in a password list, you can go through a password list in a relatively short amount of time. That's pretty good. It looks pretty good, right? Weak. Why? It's also in the Rock You password list, but why is that in the password list? Uh, clever. So people like to do keyboard walks. And they think they're using a good password because it's both numbers and letters. But because that's happened enough times, people have included it in password lists that are found in the wild. Weak or strong? Weak, why? Eh, it is weak. Um, this was actually one that was cracked by Hashcat. Um, and there's a, a utility called uh, Naive Hashcat, and it basically just runs through some of the Hashcat uh, techniques that have been known to work pretty well. And what we'll notice here is it's a pretty good length, and it has mixed case, and it has symbols and everything, but there's actually human nature that puts you at risk when you're choosing a password. Humans love to capitalize the first letter of things. And they like to put numbers at the end because you type in your password and it's like, oh wait, you need to have a number in it. Okay, I'll put the number one at the end or maybe I'll put an exclamation point at the end. It's, it's terrible. Uh, so this was actually determined through brute force. It didn't actually find it. It didn't use a dictionary-based attack on it, but it basically used some of the human being sorts of attributes of passwords that people choose. So Hashcat takes advantage of that because when people choose passwords using their brain, they're also putting themselves at a disadvantage because the folks doing password cracking, they realize that and they take advantage of that. So here's one, weak or strong. It's got, it doesn't look like it's a dictionary word. Uh, this one is weak, but the reason is a little bit different because in this case, the author left us a note. So if I go ahead and look at this file, code app sign in credentials dot text, I can see right here's the password. This is a file that is in the app that they have distributed. This is publicly available in the Google Play Store. They left the text file there. Uh, so that's kind of bad. This one's better. I like this one. This one's got mixed case. It's got your uh, bang at the end, so pretty strong. Uh, it's also weak. Why is that? The author again left a note. In this case, they have a file called readme.txt, so they're not really trying to hide anything. Um, when I look at the contents of that file, I can say, okay, your Apple developer credentials are, this is your email address, this is your password. I've also got my Google Play credentials, and then also the password for the P12 file. So they basically left everything all in the app that they've published to the Google Play Store. Now we're getting better, right? These are good passwords, right? Can you see where I'm going with this game? It's also weak. 
Why is this? This one is not from like a note left with the app, but the password is in the app. Um, if I look at this file strings.xml, I can see, well, here's the actual password in there. Sorry, I zip past it quickly. Uh, but you can see right in that XML file. So all it's taking is somebody looking at the app to determine, all right, well, there's a password. Uh, here's a better one. This one is also weak. Uh, this one is in the application as well. Um, I sanitized it just because I don't want anybody to be sad that I'm talking about how horrible their code is. Um, but this one, the app developer took a little bit of an extra step in that they didn't have it as a string, right? So nobody would ever be able to know what that password is, except, uh, uh, yeah. So these are all real world application passwords, or excuse me, private key passwords that I've seen. This one's pretty good in that it actually looks like it's memorable because, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated, but there's, there's parts to it. Um, this one is also weak. It's in the app, but in a different form. Uh, this one is in a .so file. If you have an Android app, it's mostly Java-like code, but you can also have compiled code. And I can see here, uh, decompile it in Ida, and I can see, right, we've got our password right there. Finally, any guesses on this one? Have you, have you caught on to my game yet? Ah, I got you. Why is this one strong? It is long. It is one that I randomly generated. It uses a good selection of both capital lowercase symbols. Um, and it doesn't have any patterns that are recognizable by a cracker. Um, just don't use that password because it's now actually weak because I told you all what it is. So what I quickly realized is like people go through various like tr ways of trying to protect private keys and they use passwords that are really horrible and also good passwords, but if it's in the app, it doesn't matter. You can make it as strong as you want. You could have it be 64 characters long, but it doesn't matter if the app uses the key. Um, I came across a particular case study that I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into, and this is uh, Samsung Smart Home. I have reached out to Samsung and they begrudgingly are okay with me talking about it. Sanitized a little bit of it, but it's worth looking into. Uh, what, as I'm downloading Android apps, one of the things that I'm looking at are um, like the install counts, right? So if I've got something that's got between one and five million installs, it might be worth looking into a little bit deeper. Uh, here I'm leveraging my SQLite database. It's pretty straightforward, but I've basically got my keys database. And I noticed that there were a number of apps that had this file in it, common 14k underscore m priv. You know, the fact that it has the word priv in it is a, a pretty good tell. Um, but one of the things that I looked at is, is the key used by the app? And I can see out of these four applications, one of the apps uses the key. Aha, this is where we dig into it a little bit deeper. Now, if I were to try to brute force this and it's not used by the app, I have to make some guesses as to maybe it's in a password list, maybe I'm gonna try to use Hashcat Naive, which it didn't, or excuse me, I think this particular key format wasn't supported by Hashcat, so I couldn't leverage Hashcat, but what we have here is we have one application, which is your smart home refrigerator, because everybody definitely needs a refrigerator that has like a full-blown OS in it, because, you know, helps keep your food cold. So let's just grep to see what uses that particular file name. And I can see, in this particular case, I'm using uh, APK tool to get the, uh, the Smalley code. Um, I'm also using a tool called Jeb to get the Java, uh, which is a little bit more human readable, not necessarily recompilable into an Android app, but I can see here, I've got this thing called smart home launcher activity.java. So that gives me something to look into a little bit deeper. And I can see we've got this thing here that says set password. So it looks like a base 64 based on the character set and the, the trailing equals on it. So I base six, uh, hmm. that's not right. <laughs> if I ever decode a password and it has like a line feed in it, something has definitely gone wrong. Well, if I dig into this a little bit deeper, I can see, well, what's the set password code look like? So I can see here's a function called set password. Here's a function that that calls and it passes the argument to it. So I can look at that. 
Um, here I've got a function called decrypt PDE. It's actually very complicated. I, I sanitized a lot out of this. It's a very complicated decryption function. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Why? I have the code right in front of me. So what I can do is I can basically write a patch here that gives me a, a main function that I call. Uh, I'm just going to call this function myself, given the, the password string that I saw earlier. Uh, I'll compile it, I'll run it, and now I can see I've got my password. And it's a pretty good password. Um, I sanitize it. Um, it's 16 characters long and complicated. Uh, the ways that I can now decrypt that key is I can use OpenSSL and I can get the private key out of it. In every private key of this particular format, there is a public key inside of it. So I can actually extract a public key from that private key. Uh, so here I now have the public key information from that key, given the password that I got out of it. I can get a hash for that particular key. There's a website called CRT.sh, which leverages the Certificate Transparency Project. It's looking for you know, keys that have been seen in the wild. In this particular case, I don't see it. Um, what I can actually do is I can now compare the private key and the public key moduluses to see, is it the same? So I have a certificate file and I have a private key. If I look here, I can see the modulus of um, the private key matches the modulus of the certificate, so I know it's a match. We have a win. So I can look at the X509 details of this particular uh, certificate, and I can see that this is a key for a certificate authority. It's not something that's trusted by my browser, so I don't really care, but it's also something that can uh, represent Samsung.com. Uh, so yeah, we got that. But like I said, all of that stuff. Now, this is the part that I'm going to skip over. It's in the slide deck. Samsung says it's not a big deal because you have to be there in person, yada, yada. I'm out of time. So little section here of I'm now emailing every app author that has included a private key in their app. I don't understand. What do I do? I left this private key in to try to confuse potential hackers. Um, this guy says, well, I've got an HTTPS web server, and the app is a honeypot app. That's legit. Um, here's somebody that's concerned that their app is going to be removed from the Play Store, and I just used uh, PhoneGap. Uh, here's one. Somebody used an app tool called App Inventor. Um, it turns out every app that is created with App Inventor includes a private key that is used to sign the app inside of the app. So basically, you know, they make it easier for the developer, but they've also given people, anybody that wrote an app with App Inventor, they've now distributed their signing key to the world. Uh, here's one with an SSH server. They say it's used for so that you don't have to change the, the key. Uh, this is a good one. How much bounty you want? Because obviously, why would people do security research without a bounty? Um, it's my job. I can't accept the bounty. And then finally, the part that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm a step ahead of myself. It made me warm and fuzzy to start with. And then he says, good luck with your outdated initiatives. So I don't know if that's like a dig. Like, why are you doing this thing? Like, that's stupid. Um, and then finally, this guy says, thank you so much and good job. A little bit of statistics. I'm going to have to skim over it because I've got about a minute and a half left. I got uh, currently I'm up to like 1.8 million apps. It's something that's currently running, so these numbers are going higher. Uh, there's different key formats in there. Open VPN. Uh, 64 of those Open VPN keys are unique, which makes me wonder, like, when somebody installs a VPN app on their phone, is it really private or is it just shared with every single person that is using that VPN? I've also seen PGP private keys. Why would somebody include a PGP private key in the Android app? It's there. Uh, we also got some statistics. I've got 6,180 private keys. That means that I've emailed about 6,180 people. I regret doing that. That's not pleasant. I don't like, you know, only one small fraction of people actually get back to me. You've seen a subset of the answers I get. Uh, about 2,000 Google Play signing keys. I've also seen Apple Push private keys. I've seen iPhone developer private keys. At some point years ago, I paid 100 bucks out of pocket so I could be an iPhone developer to write a test app. Well, I can just pick, I already got 21 private keys here. 
Um, we also have enterprise private keys, which are used for signing multiple applications. I can now push out, I can provision my iPhones to accept anything signed by those enterprise keys. Some of the cracking statistics, both between the RockU password list and strings from the app code, I get about 70, what is that, 76, 77%, 76%. Um, that's pretty good. That's, people are using pretty bad, pa it's good from a cracker's perspective, it's bad from a password use perspective. Finally, Java key store is a little bit less. Hashcat Naive does a pretty good job. If you haven't looked at it, I would check into it. Conclusions, finally, five seconds to spare. If your app has a private key in it, it might be an accident by such as people zipping up a directory that has a private key in it. It also just might be an app that's not designed in the best way. Um, and the impact depends on what the key is used for. I've reached out both to Google and Apple. I'm doing this as an independent researcher. We are a nonprofit. I'm spidering and pulling in apps from the Play Store. It would be nice if somebody submits an app to their store, warn the developer, don't block it, but at least tell the developer, hey, you got a private key in here. And then the general result is fewer mistakes, everybody's happier, yada, yada. That's it. Thank you. I might have seconds. I don't, do I have time for any questions? Uh, I'm all out. You're know. all out of time. But um, thank you very much for Thanks. attending. This is track three with Will Dorman from CERT CC. Uh, we will be switching out for our next speaker.